Welcome to A Woman's Clarity, a podcast that empowers financial professionals to better connect with and serve their female clients. Listen in as host Kirsten Schlumbaum, Vice President of Annuity Sales at C2P, and her guests help you speak the language of women clients and meet their unique financial needs and goals. Welcome to A Woman's Clarity. I'm Kirsten Schlumbaum, Vice President of Annuity Sales here at C2P. And one thing I really love about being a part of A Woman's Clarity is the opportunity to network with other phenomenal female-focused organizations. In October, I got the opportunity to go to the Women in Financial Services National Conference in San Diego. And that is where I met our guest today, Kim Taylor with FP Transitions, and I instantly had a connection because we talked about how we can empower women in this industry, how we can help the next generation. And so together, Kim and I decided to let's do a podcast. So Kim, welcome. Thank you very much. And I have to say it was great to meet you out in San Diego as well. That was one of the most inspiring and engaging conferences. And I'm already looking forward to next year. It'll be exciting. An inspiring thing about being a part of Women in Financial Services are the different women we get to meet and interact with through a holistic lens for financial services. So before we talk about our topic today and how we help the next generation and why succession planning is so important, Kim, do you want to share a little bit about what you do and what your company does? Absolutely. So I'm a consultant with FP Transitions, and I work with business founders and next generation owners creating internal succession plans. I also do consulting with advisors on mergers and acquisitions and creating ensemble businesses. And FP Transitions itself is a business of about 60 people. We were founded in 1999 by David Grau Sr. And uh, we have people with areas of expertise in analytics, consulting, valuations, legal, and M&A. You guys do a lot. So we do. Tell me more about FP Transitions, because what I'm reading here is that you've helped with succession planning for financial advisors for over 10 years, and you're seeing generation one, two, and you're also tiptoeing into generation three. So how, how do you exactly help wealth managers set up this in, internal transition plan? And what does that look like? All right. It is a really rewarding process. And what we see is that founders of wealth management firms are entrepreneurs and they've started their business from scratch, but now they're thinking about their legacy. We're working with advisors, some are as old as 70, uh, but really of all ages. And we're helping them figure out how am I going to transition this business to the next generation? And they're the G1 owners. So we call them generation one. And they're looking for the G2s, which are G generation two. So I'll tell you exactly how we do it. I'll, I'll try and be brief, but I think it's important for people to understand the basic concepts. The first thing we do is we help them set up an entity if they don't already have an S Corp or an LLC set up. And then we value the business. So our valuations team has done over 16,000 valuations. So we have really accurate data to be able to tell how much that business is worth. And then we usually start and recommend maybe a 5% sale to a next generation owner. It really depends on the time frame of the seller and the number of buyers that they're going to be. That price can be discounted because people are buying a minority interest and it's not liquid and it's not marketable. So it's not as if they could take the shares that they get and sell them on the open market like Apple or Microsoft or something like that. So then you have to think about how are they going to pay for that? And usually with this first sale, the easiest thing is seller financing. So the owner lends them the money and they pay it back over time through those profit interests they're now getting as an owner. We also see bank financing is becoming more common to be able to allow those next generation owners to buy in, but as interest rates have gotten quite high, and so we don't see people using that as frequently. 
So once they've done that purchase, everybody really sits back and says, how's it going? Are they, are they acting like owners? Are they bringing new ideas to the table? Do they understand the balance sheet and the P&L and are making uh, suggestions for improvement? So that's just the nuts and bolts of how we get it set up. Okay. So for our listening audience, we just briefly define for everyone listening G1, G2, and G3. Once again, because we are, it's it's pretty intricate process. It sounds seamless when you say it, but it's an intricate, it's an inter- intricate process. Easy for me to say, so it's probably not easy to do. <laughs> so G1 are those founding advisors that they built the business from scratch. They're very entrepreneurial and they have worked really, really hard. Oftentimes when they're looking for G2, the next generation to succeed them, they're looking for somebody like them. However, there's a really different skill set that's needed to manage a business that's continuing on. Uh, they don't have to put in those 12 hour days, seven days a week, like the founders did. Usually, those G2 owners are 10 to 15 years younger. And ideally, for every founder, there's maybe two of those people who are buying in. And then you're going to look another 10 to 15 years in the future. These could be people that are in high school right now, and they're going to be the third generation of owners. And we've started seeing that maybe in the last five or six years where folks are bringing on that next uh, third generation. The little high schooler in me from back in the 90s was I wish somebody would have found me back then and I could have had this pathway earlier, but I love what we do. Where are the next generations coming from when you're looking at G2 Mm -hmm. and so forth? Because I think that's really important because if we are looking to have a succession plan or bring in new members, how do we do that? Where can you find them? So I'll tell you about G2 and G3. G2 advisors are probably working in the business right now and may be interested in being part of that succession plan, but maybe the founder hasn't talked to them about it yet. They could be folks in other careers. Maybe they are a wholesaler or maybe they've been an accountant and they're looking for something something different to do. This is being an advisor. It's a wonderful profession. I mean, not only are you rewarded so much by how truly important the work is you do for your clients, but it's, it's a flexible kind of business. So it's, it's really, I think a great opportunity for, for those people that are entering the profession later on in life. In terms of G3 advisors, uh, we are seeing more and more programs for college students that are specifically focusing on financial planning. I was at a recent conference. There was the University of Akron, Bryant University, the Woodbury School of Business, and Texas A&M. And they all had really significant financial planning programs. In some cases, students who are graduating can go right into sitting for the CFP exam. But I'd also like to say, while some firms are targeting these folks with that specific financial planning background, there might be people in other industries who are similar, maybe they're coming from technology or communications, and, and there's the opportunity to, for, to look for people in other places as well. I'm not sure about your background and how you got into the financial services industry. I myself was a sociology major. I was going to save the world. And my first job in my field was working for the American Red Cross, making $18,000 a year and barely scraping by. And I got the opportunity to sell life insurance. And I ran with it. And that's how I got into the industry. So I, I, it makes me happy being at this like season of my life, hearing about these programs and schools and opportunities for the next generations to get involved in what we do, because it's really important. But there's a lot, as you said, there's a lot of flexibility in what we do here. So when looking at the next gen, either G2 or G3, what's important to them in the work environment? What does their work-life balance look like? And real quick before I answer that, I have to tell you, when I graduated from college, I had a degree in art history (laughs) and I worked in the museum field in New York for five years before switching to financial services. So accidental financial services members, but I wouldn't change a thing. I mean, I might joke and say the high schooler and me that was in the DECA club 
and vice president of the state of Iowa may have really enjoyed it. But everything I've done in my life has brought me to this point. I think it makes me stronger in the industry. So we're accidental financial services people with a passion. I agree. We could do a whole other podcast of all the folks like us. <laughs> but no, but getting back to the topic at hand, I'm sure we can get off course talking about that. But the next generation does have different requirements when looking for the job they want to hang their hat at and connect mm -hmm. to for a long period of time. So what are they looking for? I think that we're going to see more diversity. People are going to come from different family units. They're going to have different needs. They could be single moms, married with kids, the sandwich generation. People like that might need flexible schedules. Um, and we also all know after 2020, that really changed how we do business. And we don't always need to require people to be in a physical location anymore. I have a friend who bought a camper and she's in Texas right now. And she works and she's driving around the country. And I know specifically for FP transitions, it's benefited us. We have people in, in 12 different states. So I think that having that off-site, on-site flexibility is going to be important as well. Um, but I still think there's something to be said for being in an office. Um, in our industry, there are more people who really have that culture and want people to be in an office. Maybe they have a lot of client meetings in person, and so that's important to them. And I think even if someone is going to be an offsite person, being able to be in the office for training, I think is really important. Well, you hit, you hit the nail on the head with a couple of things. My company itself is located in Ohio. I myself am in, in Oregon. And is FP Transitions in Oregon and you're in New Hampshire? You're in Maine. Yes, we're uh, headquartered in Lake Oswego, which is just south of Portland. Just down the road for me. And I love it. But I think you're you're absolutely accurate when you're talking about needing the flexibility to either be able to work remotely or have a place to hang your hat and call home and go into an office because some people operate really well independently, like myself being remote. And then there's other people that thrive in that office environment. And the cool thing about financial services is it's always going to be a relationship business. So it's important for us to meet the next generation where they can thrive. Exactly. And what would then, if we're looking at, if, if, if I had a company I was working with you and looking for the next gen, what would make a firm attractive for the next generation? It's really important for them to see an opportunity for growth. If you're a business, you have to be able to show somebody what is their career path. Or it could even be, what is the path to partnership? As we know, more and more young advisors are getting job offers these days. And you really need to find a way to show them that they have a future at your business. So having a career path, like I said, is really important. Also having that path to partnership. So we recommend that people actually put a document together it's not a promise. Somebody could meet all the qualifications, but you still may not want them to be a partner in your business, but it is a path to show them, here's what you need to do in order to be considered for partnership in X number of years. And that could be things like being a mentor for junior employees or having leadership qualities. Um, you may also have more uh, objective things that you're looking for, um, such as being a lead advisor to a certain number of clients, having a certain retention rate. Um, you may have goals uh, in terms of revenue or AUM. So outlining all of those really makes everybody get together on the same page and makes folks realize, you know, I, I really do have a future here. And it helps them understand that they can be part of something, that they can make a contribution to a business, a business that's committed to growth and development. I heard Caleb Brown, who has uh, the firm XY Planning, and he was talking about the recruits he's working with, and they all want to work at above average companies. That's what they're looking for. And he said that the majority of the clients who are coming to him looking for people are great firms, but they're, they're, they're not standing out. 
So having something that makes you stand out and really show you're committed to opportunities for G3 advisors is important. I know several firms where they have set up um, special programs to work with younger clients. In one case, they even went so far as to specifically set up a program for young physicians. So having those kinds of programs in place is also an opportunity for G3s to get engaged with a company and be working with people who are their peers. And they're really going to be able to provide a lot of, of support and guidance when they're working with their peers. It's like you're speaking my language. One thing I'm very proud about working at C2P is our career path and compensation model that we work with our lead advisors and their sub-advisors to help create that career path. Because it, a goal without a plan is just a, something written on a piece of paper. So if we can help our advisors and sub-advisors have a path to either partnership or to, or maybe going from a pair planner to chair to or sub-advisor to a lead advisor, it makes employee, employees feel comfortable, confident, and with a goal. And for lack of a better term, it keeps employees sticky to the organization. And one thing, is, since this is a female-focused podcast, we were talking about it with us. We talked about how do we attract more females to financial services? And I feel passionately about this, and it's really important. It's great that women can set their own schedule. It's great that we can make really good living, but we also need a path forward. So based on what you're telling me for Generation 2 or G2 and G3 and what we do here it's a phenomenal opportunity to help grow our footprint and talent. I do you want to add any more to that? I kind of went off on my own little passion project, but you're absolutely right. There's going to be a need for advice for women more and more. As we know, women may have two events in their life, the death of a spouse, the death of their parents. Those are financial parts of the life. And they want to go to somebody that they can trust. I don't have the statistics in front of me, but uh, very often a woman will leave her financial advisor if her spouse dies and go to a, a female advisor. Absolutely, because they haven't felt heard. They don't feel educated and they want to be seen, heard and educated and part of the solution. So mm -hmm. I love the fact that we're teaching the next generation Mailer. Now I'm going to get us back on track for the G2 and G3 because I could probably again talk all day about how we get more females into the business. But how do small businesses and RIAs compete for the talent against the larger companies and custodians? You're right. There's a lot of consolidation um, going on these days. But what you do is is you have your culture clearly defined and you pick out the top benefits that you feel you offer and really talk about why they're important to your firm and to your team. I don't know if you're familiar with Angie Herbers, but she recently wrote a really interesting article and explained how it's truly culture that's going to keep people at a firm and it's not about salary. Um, she went on to talk in the article about um, how salaries fluctuate in bull and bear markets it's a really interesting article, but it's it's about that culture. And the other thing too is we talked about a path to partnership. And if you're in a smaller firm, you probably have a better chance of having that opportunity. If you're in a business that has 500 employees, that there may not be that path to partnership available to you. And I think there's also the type of person who wants that family feel of a small RIA. I think there's different personalities and we always have to take in mind that there are different personalities that fit with different organizations. There are some people that are destined to go to a larger firm just because that is their fit, but there's a whole group of people that like that smaller firm for, just like you said, that family feel, that relationship, that what you do and what you say matters. So how do wealth management firms find these individuals looking for that, that fit. So I talked earlier uh, about the schools that are setting up um, FP or financial planning programs. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is creating internship programs, a solid internship program. 
And I could talk about that for a whole half <laughs> hour uh, because you can't just bring somebody in and have them, I was going to say make photocopies, but these days it's probably checking emails. <laughs> Scanning documents. <laughs> right, right. You want it to be meaningful. Um, and and that can be a really, really great way to get people introduced to your organization. Um, there's actually a new organization called the BLX Internship Program, and they fill internships for uh, candidates who are Latinx or Black, and they were just founded in 2020. So they are really helping to bring diversity um, into, into our industry. You can look for talent at conferences that you attend. And some other ideas are recruiters, talking to your broker dealer or custodian, advertising, social media, industry groups and associations. And the last thing is, I would say, tell everybody you know that you're, <laughs> you're hiring because people really want to help young people find job opportunities. And you mentioned helping with diversity, equity, and inclusion. I love that because the next generation of financial advising cl clients are not just, you know, the, the white American. It's, it's going to be females. It's going to be minorities. It's going to be, it is already a huge demographic of population that we need to be able to connect with. So I love that you are also focusing there because with diversity, there com comes more opportunity. Mm -hmm. But when we're looking at the different groups to recruit from for the next gen, how far out should we be planning for the next generation? Ideally, the day you start your business, it's, it's really important that you take the time to be able to cultivate those younger people, find out if they're a good fit, and then have a, a long runway for them to be able to buy in into the business over time. Unfortunately, a lot of folks, they run out of time. They, they haven't found the right successors. Another thing that's been happening is these businesses grow. There's great profitability in wealth management firms, great growth in revenue. And we've seen businesses, they're now worth $12 million and a 5% interest is going to cost $600,000. So that is not something that most young people are going to be able to, to handle. So really starting early is, is super important. One of the reasons that the founders don't start early enough is that they don't want to give up some of that income that they're making. But what you have to understand is once you bring in those younger owners, your business is going to grow faster. And so they'll not only have that growth, but the younger advisors can start taking things off their plate too. So we all wish that people would start earlier, but every advisor has a five-year plan. I'll do it in five years. And you see them <laughs> at the next conference. I'll do it in five years. So I love what I'm doing. Years. I'm not ready to retire. So maybe in five years, right? That's what you're hearing. Right. But if you start bringing in new owners, you have, have more options now. So mm -hmm. if something happens to you, you've got a built-in continuity plan right there. Maybe they can buy you out or you could still decide to sell. But frankly, selling a business with multiple owners is a lot more valuable than just selling your book of clients. Right. Well, are there any other options for rewarding, retaining great talent without selling them equity. What are your thoughts on that? So we are talking with clients more and more about synthetic equity. And so what that is, is stock appreciation right, stock option, phantom stock. And you can put these plans together in many, many different ways. But in general, what you're saying is, if our business grows, you're gonna be included in part of that growth but we're not gonna pay that out to you unless you've been here for three years. And you can set that up based on AUM, based on growth in the value of the company. There's all kinds of different ways to do it, but it's not real equity. The person doesn't become an owner. They don't have voting rights. They don't have access to the books and records, but they are now contributing to the growth of the company and seeing how that's gonna financially reward them. And what we see is, this can be really good for somebody who's very young 
and isn't quite ready for real ownership, but you want to tie them to the company. Um, somebody may not have the necessary licenses in order to have real equity. And in other cases, people just are the type of individuals who want to take a financial risk of being an owner. It's giving them opportunity to have a, 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 a sort of ownership without being an owner, a career path without having the pressure of ownership, but an opportunity to grow and really root with the company that they have chosen to be a part of. And I absolutely love it. And I know that we are kind of wrapping up with our time, but I wanted to ask you a few questions about, do you have any examples for us, maybe some female generation two owners that you've worked with and that have had success with this kind of planning? In fact, there's somebody I am working with this week and it's super exciting. Um, we started working with this company about nine years ago wow. and it's it was she and her dad and over the years, they brought in four other owners and the dad retired a couple of years ago. And so they took all of the, his clients over. They took over all his responsibilities and they had that nine years to do it. Now, he's still retaining a piece of ownership and they're uh, doing a transaction by the end of this year where they're going to buy him out 100%. And it's really neat because now you have this young woman who is is leading the firm and and running things and now she and her team are making decisions about what the business is going to look like as they're bringing on the next generation and it's it's really really um, rewarding and selfishly i'm going to ask you this question are you helping her with that g3 plan as well that is going to be the plan for 2024 Wonderful. I love it, Kim. It just feels like you've got such a wonderful opportunity for our advisor base when looking at the future, where they, how long they want to be lead, where they want to be the owner and, and setting that plan up. Before we close out, I just want to ask you one more question. I know I didn't prep you for this, but is there any advice that you would give to our female audience that are listening, even our male advisors that are listening on like your best practice, your best advice for those wanting to get into the business or grow their business? Well, to grow your business, I think everything we've talked about today, um, we've heard a lot about having a specialization. Mm -hmm. And I think that also can be a really important way to differentiate yourself. Some people work with retired military some folks work with doctors, some people work with um, couples. And so having that specialty allows you to help people in a, in a deeper way because you really understand, like with the, somebody out of the military, you understand what their retirement benefits look like and, and you have that insight and can really help focus their planning that's wow. going to specifically help them. I love it. And Kim, I know I just threw you for a loop with that last question. I love what FP Transition is doing to help G1, G2, and hopefully G3. I appreciate the time that you've given me. And those listening, if you haven't started thinking about your next steps or how you're going to grow your G2 or G3 advisor base, please reach out. We're here to support you. Be successful. And then when you hand that baton over, help that next generation be successful. So Kim, thank you so much for being here. And those listening, thank you for taking the time to listen because when you give us your time, I know you're taking your time from what you do best is helping your clients. So thank you. And whatever you do today, do something good. Thanks for tuning in to A Woman's Clarity brought to you by C2P, an organization whose purpose is to educate, train, grow, and support holistic financial advisors so families can achieve true prosperity. Subscribe now and never miss an opportunity to learn how to become a more proactive, holistic advisor to the fast-growing female client base. Visit C2PEnterprises.com to learn how we can help support and enhance your business. At the time of delivery and any subsequent publishing, information was deemed reliable but is subject to change by the time of listening or viewing.
The contents of this piece include the opinions and projections of C2P Enterprises, are subject to change, and are for informational purposes only. The information provided in this presentation is not intended to be individual investment, tax or legal advice.